you may be seated. We are in 1 Corinthians chapter 8. Sunday school lesson was to Corinthians, the Corinthian church as well. And it's interesting that the Apostle Paul is underscoring uh, in 2 Corinthians, obviously, what he was presenting in 1 Corinthians. So when he talks about uh, in 2 Corinthians, Come out from among them and be ye separate, saith the Lord, and touch not the unclean thing, and I will receive you and be a father unto you, and you shall be my sons and daughters. Okay. Unclean to who was the question we, meant, we mentioned, we brought up. Who determines unclean? Who determines touch? Who determines come out who determines separation well we've got to we've got to do it according to God's idea of the whole thing otherwise our labor in that direction is totally in vain if he considers us not separated if he considers us still involved with the unclean thing then he does not have any obligation to fulfill his half of the the covenant arrangement so uh, 1 Corinthians 8 reveals to us that there were people in the church as there have been since the beginning of time who are uh, not wanting to fulfill those uh, that description of godly sorrow but they're asking the question uh, what is separation and what is the unclean thing not for the purpose of separating not for the purpose of avoiding but for the purpose of of breaking down standards that have been set by spurious arguments and it's, it's interesting that that was one of the ways that uh, Lenin said to destroy the West the communist uh, was to break down standards of godliness by spurious argumentation okay well you know why is that bad and who said it was bad and and why can't I do it and what's wrong with it and and all that sort of thing to attack standards and try to tear them down because I really don't want to do it. And so in 1 Corinthians 8, we find that there were people in the church who were doing this to the point of eating meat in an idol temple and their justification uh, was, that well, we, with the idol's nothing and, and it's just meat and, and I'm just here for such and such reason and I'm not worshiping the idol. And like you could do just about anything that you wanted to do if that was your realm of thinking and that was your justification process. So it's nothing new. It's been around for a long time. And we call it the convenient conscience. It's the plague of the church, the convenient conscience Someone who can accommodate their conscience to anything they want to do. And they convince themselves. Uh, I've got an example of that here from years past. Someone gave me a printout from Patriarch Magazine, January 21, 2002. The head covering, a church ordinance? Question mark. Well, that started on the wrong foundation. It's not a church ordinance, okay? It, it is uh, a part of the uh, teaching and so forth of the apostles and a belief of the church. It's part of modest apparel. Modest apparel, can you say modest apparel is a church ordinance? I guess it is in some degree a commandment and teaching of the church, but it's not, I wouldn't put it in the category of a church ordinance. Um, like communion, baptism, and so forth, those are church ordinances, but uh, which we would also say are ritual observances. Uh, for that are commanded but they are rules that people must dress modest and modesty if you define it biblically includes the head covering so this article here they go all the way around uh, discussing it and they are very slick in trying to work themselves away from any obligation there but in doing so they reveal they're bad exegesis when it comes to 1 Corinthians chapter 8, which we're going to get into. Because they're saying, and, and I'll read a little bit here that I wasn't planning to read. Uh, they were talking about that uh, the head covering was a relevant uh, custom to exemplify a, a uh, spiritual principle in that day. 
And then it says, how we flesh out in conduct and appearance the principle of headship and submission in our culture is a different matter. Our culture. What do you mean our culture? What if what if all the what if a group of Christians in your culture, your your country, are practicing head covering? When you say our culture, it means you're choosing the other one, right? Um, he says we do not have many remaining expressions of role distinctions in your culture. We'll get out of that culture. <clears throat> Certainly women ought to dress in feminine, a feminine way rather than in the unisex fashions of the day in your culture. Nature and gender distinction suggest that women ought to have longer hair than men. Women ought to conduct themselves with quietness and deference in the presence of their husbands or other men. So they're, they're working to a direction. But listen to what they say here about uh, as they refer to 1 Corinthians 8. In the present case, it is possible that the head covering was a cultural expression of the universally binding principle of headship. Certainly, there are times when a group is bound to a particular form of obedience that would not apply at another time and place. In Acts 15, the apostles and elders instructed Christians not to eat meat connected with idols, and the recipients of the letter would have been bound to obey. However, elsewhere in the New Testament, it is clear that Christians have liberty as to whether to eat such meat or not. 1 Corinthians 8, in brackets. The Acts 15 practice was binding upon those to whom it was addressed. They obviously don't know that it was addressed to all the churches, since it dealt with an issue in terms of their circumstances. But it was not intended that the practice be taken to bind every believer in every place and time. Wrong. Uh, the decrees for to keep, not to ignore, they were decrees for to keep, were delivered to all the churches in uh, Antioch, Syria, uh, throughout modern day Turkey which would include Asia Minor all the churches and we find that in the book of Revelation uh, Pergamos and Thyatira are rebuked on this very point okay, for eating things offered to idols why? because it had already been settled now what they miss is they miss Paul's way of dealing with issues we saw it in chapter 7 where he talked about abiding in the same a uh, place where God called you in the same social setting and then he went on to give some examples and then he brought it right back to his original point okay he states a principle he illustrates the principle and then he gives a conclusion and that's the way he works through the Bible he he uh, states it in, in chapter 8 1 through 13 he illustrates it in 9 1 through 10 13 and he gives the conclusion in 10 14 to 11 1 so the entire argument is 8 1 to 11 1 and uh, the chapter breaks are to be ignored when you're studying the scripture because they were not given by inspiration of the Holy Ghost nor were they given by the apostles but we use them for convenience um, so in 1 Corinthians chapter 8 it says now that means we're starting a new subject it doesn't say now again until 11 2 now I praise you brethren that you remember me in all things okay he's starting a new subject so he didn't say there was not a now like there was in verse 11 to chapter 12 verse 1. Now concerning spiritual gifts. But in chapter 8 verse 1 we have a now. And that continues on till 11 1. Now is touching things offered unto idols. Things. Understand when it says things he means meat and drink. We're talking about food. Okay? Because there is a... Uh, a phrase he uses, all things are lawful unto me, but all things are not expedient. That only applies to the context. Every time that phrase is used, 1 Corinthians 6.12 it was used, and 1 Corinthians 10.23 it's used, and it's talking about meat. All meats are lawful, but not all meats are expedient. Okay? He's referring to things offered to idols. The word things there does not mean uh, everything, but it means if we're talking about a principle here in the context, it's talking about meat. If you go back to chapter 6 and verse 12, <clears throat> all things are lawful unto me, but all things are not expedient. All things are lawful for me, but I will not be brought under the power of any. Meats for the belly and the belly for meats. He's talking about the same subject, okay? He's talking about food offered to idols and that these food, all these foods are lawful. Okay, but they're not, they're not always expedient, and he's going to explain why. Now, 
in this, uh, we're talking about things offered to idols. We know that we all have knowledge. Knowledge puffeth up, but charity edifieth. These people were arguing for their liberty on the basis of a higher knowledge. We find out when we go through it that it was actually ignorance. And oftentimes ignorance presents itself and manifests itself to, as a claim of higher knowledge. But in reality, it's ignorance. Um, because it's lacking very important data. It's lacking information. When a young person argues with their father about a, uh, a situation, and they think that they've got all the facts, and the father says, that's true, but you're not thinking about this, 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 and this. It's like, oh, yeah, well, somebody who's been around a while sometimes sees a, a much bigger picture than you do. And that's what we're going to see here. Now, he starts out by stating uh, what they were saying and why it was not okay. And then he illustrates it for a ways with himself and his, his own personal uh, zeal and the proper zeal for truth. But let me just let's skip on over to 1014 because I want to read the conclusion of the matter before we get into it. So you understand where he's heading and you can kind of keep an idea of where he's going with this. So you understand he is not saying that the Corinthians had liberty to decide for themselves. He is clarifying what do we do if there's meat bought in the shambles and we don't know about it okay but he doesn't in no way does he justify the eating of meat in an idol temple or any way being involved with that idol temple he starts out by following their train of thought and then he takes them to a true christian's thinking and uh, 10 14 says this wherefore wherefore is an important word it's good to see what it's there for amen therefore and wherefore you want to know why it's there and he comes to the argument, and this is the conclusion. Wherefore, my dearly beloved, flee from idolatry. I speak as to wise men, judge you what I say. The cup of blessing which we bless, is it not the communion, that's the word koinonia, of the body of the blood of Christ? <clears throat> the bread which we break, is it not the koinonia of the body of Christ? For we being many are one bread and one body, for we are all partakers of that one bread. Behold, Israel after the flesh. Are not they which eat of the sacrifices partakers? Koinonos, it, it related to that word koinonia. They are partakers. They are uh, in communion with the altar. Okay? And that's what the word partakers refers to. It, it's a communion. When they partake of the sacrifice, they are having a form of communion. What say I then? That the idol is anything? Or that which is offered in sacrifice to idols is anything? But I say that the things which the Gentiles sacrifice, they sacrifice to devils and not to God. And I would not that ye should have koinonos with devils. Okay, so it starts out the hot shot saying, hey man, you know, I, I know the idol's nothing in the world. And this is just meat and I'm just eating the meat. And this is no big deal. And why, what's wrong with it? Why can't I do it? And I, mean, I, I want to do it. But my friends are there and blah, blah, blah. Okay, we hear all this. We've heard this. If you're in any type of ministry, when you're trying to uphold standards, you hear all this garbage all the time. If you're a parent, you'll hear it. Um, but then Paul says, okay, so much for being nothing. Now I'm going to show you that ultimately you're having communion with the devil. Wow. Well, that's a total different perspective, isn't it? And Paul starts out because that's where he's heading. Um, you cannot drink the cup of the Lord and the cup of devils. You cannot be partakers of the Lord's table and the table of devils. Do we provoke the Lord to jealousy? Are we stronger than he? All things, all things, all food, all meat offered to idols, all these meats, not, not necessarily offered to idols, but all meats are lawful for me. But all things are not expedient. All things are lawful for me, but all things that if I not. Let no man seek his own, but every man another's wealth. Whatsoever is sold in the shambles, Whatever meat is sold in the shambles, that eat. Asking no question for conscience sake. The shambles was a meat market where you could get cheaper meat because it had already been offered and, and used in the temple and they had to move it. Uh, they had to move it out while it was still good and so they made a profit. Um, some of it was offered in the temple. Some of it was not. You didn't have to stop and inquire at the meat market. Okay, where did this come from? How was it killed? 
was an offer to an idol. Paul says you didn't have to go to all that trouble because indeed it was just meat. But that's different than eating the meat in the temple. He never did endorse that at all. It says here um, that he'd asking no question for conscience sake. For the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof and it's just a piece of meat, basically. If any of them that bid you believe not, bid you to a feast. Now this is not a idle feast, but if someone who's unbelieving bids you to a, a meal at the home of you know, your unbelieving parent, your unbelieving cousin, maybe a wedding or whatever, and ye be disposed to go. Whatsoever is set before you eat, asking no question for conscience sake. But if any man send you, this is offered and sacrificed unto idols. Now they wouldn't say that if you were sitting in the idol temple. That's a given, okay? This is not in the idol temple. But if somebody said, well, this meat, you know, this came from the, the temple. Eat not for his sake that showed it. Okay? And for conscience sake, for the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. Conscience, I say, not by thine own. You know it's just a piece of meat, but of the other. For why is my liberty judged from another man's conscience? For if I by grace be partaker, why am I evil spoken of for that which I give thanks? This is their argument. This is what they were saying, and he's repeating them. Whether therefore you eat or drink or whatsoever you do, do all to the glory of God, giving give none offense, neither to the Jews, nor to the Gentiles, nor to the church of God, even as I please all men in all things, not seeking mine own profit, but the profit of many, that they may be saved. 11.1 1 says, Be followers of me, even as I also am of Christ. End of argument. Okay? Now, this is where he's going. But he starts out. Now, verse chapter 8, verse 1. Now as touching things, or meats, drinks, food, offered unto idols, we know that we all have knowledge. Knowledge alone puffeth up, but charity edifieth. In other words, you're boasting as though you have greater knowledge than the apostles that were taught by Christ. You think that your argumentation is so wise and smart that you have become immune, and you have immunity to obeying the apostles, because of your so-called knowledge and your arguments, and they sound good to you, but he says you're getting puffed up. Charity edifieth. Well, what does charity do? The charity thinks of something besides you. Charity thinks of your influence, your impact, what direction you're going. So knowledge puffeth up, but charity edifieth. What you do with knowledge is all important. Knowledge alone without love is ignorance and deception. Because love is God's knowledge. Love is not just a feeling. God's law is love. Love is a way of thinking. Love is an unselfish disposition with true concern for another, with the principles of God underneath as a foundation, backing up the thoughts. So true love has to do with pursuing eternal, ultimate good, the highest good, the right good, the only good, God's good, God's way of looking, God's way of thinking, and you're doing it, and what it does, it edifies everybody around you. That is true knowledge, because that is right thinking, okay? So a supposed knowledge that all it can do is argue for personal liberty is truly ignorance, because all you're doing is thinking about me, me, me. And what I want to do, and why can't I do it, and what's wrong with it? You're not thinking about anything beyond you, and that's very short-sighted, amen? Verse 2, And if any man think that he knoweth anything, he knoweth nothing, yet as he ought to know. But if any man love God, the same is none of him. To truly love God, so as to be known of Him, you must really know God. Let me say that again. To truly love God so as to be known of Him, you must really know God. This is the pinnacle of intelligence. This is the high point of human existence and experience, is loving God so as to be known of Him. The mechanic who solves the problem is the most knowledgeable. Not the one that can talk the most, not the one that has the letters by his name, but the one that solves the problem. The president who creates the best economy is the best economist. <clears throat> Verse 4. As concerning, therefore, the eating of those things, eating of those things, and when he says all things are lawful, remember, things, when he says things, he's talking about things you eat. 
when in this context. As concerning, therefore, the eating of those things that are offered in sacrifice to idols, we know that an idol is nothing in the world, and that there is none other God but one. For though there be that are called gods, whether in heaven or earth, as there are be gods many and lords many, but to us there is but one God, the Father, of whom are all things, and we in Him, and one Lord Jesus Christ, by whom are all things, and we by Him. Okay? He's acknowledging that, yes, you have some true points, but you don't have all the points. Okay? Verse 7, How be it? There is not in every man that knowledge, for some with conscience of the idol unto this hour eat it as a thing offered unto an idol, and their conscience being weak is defiled. So, how be it has to do with the fact that what you're not considering is others. What you're not considering is your influence. What you're not considering is where will this lead? Okay, and he goes on. But meat, but meat alone commendeth us not to God, for neither if we eat are we the better, and neither if we eat not are we the worse. I, I concede that, that's true. But, take heed, lest by any means this liberty of yours become a stumbling block to them that are weak. Now listen. <clears throat> For if any man see thee which hast knowledge, sit at me in the idol's temple, shall not the conscience of him which is weak be emboldened to eat those things which are offered to idols, and through thy knowledge... Shall the weak brother perish for whom Christ died? See where he's taking him? God, it's amazing when God looks down at the church. There's a major difference when you look at issues with only you in mind. Or when you look at issues with the church, the lost, your example, wisdom, offending God, grieving his spirit in mind. You look at things totally different when you look from the different perspective. And that's why you end up with one man dying for his faith while another man is griping because the preacher preached on tithing. You got one man sacrificing his home and his job for the mission field. You got another man that's upset because the church wants him to hold a sign for two hours on Sunday afternoon. Because you have these two different perspectives. Ask not... What can God do for me? But ask, what can I do for my Savior? Amen. Ask not, how can I enjoy a Christian life? No, ask, how can I glorify my Lord? God has not asked you to inconvenience yourself to help Him. He has asked you to lose your life so He can give you eternal life. It's not about you and your liberty. Now, it's interesting, he says, and through thy knowledge of the weak brother perish. Adam Clark says, there are many uh, curious, thin-spun theories in the rabbinical writings concerning entering idol temples and eating there, and even worshiping there, providing the mind be towards the true God. Dr. Lightfoot produces several quotations to prove this. Is it any wonder that the Jews were destroyed? Perhaps the man of knowledge mentioned by the Apostle was one of those who, possessing a convenient conscience, could accommodate himself to all circumstances, be a heathen without and a Christian within, and vice versa, as circumstances might require. We all have met such people. And he says here, for whom Christ died, uh, Adam Clark says, So we learn that a man may perish for whom Christ died. That blows Calvinism out the window. This admits of no quibble. If a man for whom Christ died, apostatizing from Christianity, for he is called a brother, though weak, return again to and die in idolatry, cannot go to heaven, then a man for whom Christ died may perish everlastingly. And if it were possible for a believer, whether strong or weak, to retrace his steps back to idolatry and die in it, Surely it is possible for a man who had escaped the pollutions that are in the world to return to it, live and die in its spirit, and perish everlastingly also. Let him that readeth understand. See, in Romans 14, 15, it says, But if thy brother be grieved with thy meat, now walkest thou not charitably, destroy not him with thy meat for whom Christ died. And Adam Clark's note on that says this. Same thing. From this verse we learn that a man for whom Christ died may perish, 
or have his soul destroyed, and destroyed with such a destruction as implies perdition. The original is very emphatic. Uh, Christ died in his stead, do not destroy his soul. The sacrificial death is as strongly expressed as it can be, and there is no word in the New Testament that more forcibly implies eternal ruin than the verb apalu, from which we derive that most significant name of the devil, Apollyon, the destroyer, the great universal murderer of souls. Now verse 12, look at it. So it started out, it started out as liberty. It started out as, I want to do this, why can't I, what's wrong with it? And Paul has led them to verse 12. But when ye sin so against the brethren and wound their weak conscience, ye sin against Christ. Oh, that's a much bigger matter, isn't it? Mm -hmm. Ye sin against Christ. So much for your knowledge. So much for your liberty. So much for your puffed up ways. That you would actually, your knowledge would lead a soul to hell <laughs> because they followed your example and where did it go? Where were you leading them? Verse 13, Wherefore, if meat make my brother to offend, I will eat no flesh while the world standeth, lest I make my brother to offend. So, this is the spirit of gospel charity, the spirit of a true minister, the spirit of selfless evangelism. This should be the attitude of every believer. Basically, that I want to do what is best for the team. I want to do what is best for the gospel, for the to glorify the Lord, to please the Lord. I want to do what is most productive for the winning of souls and the propagation of truth. It's not about what do I like, what do I enjoy, what, what pleases me. It's not that for a true believer. You see, that's what happens is this. True believers have that spirit. And then Satan wants to come in and he wants to push that principle in the ditch. Uh, there's some people who wish to rule the church by claiming offense and everything that is not their way of doing things. Hence, they know no forbearance but claim offense and so lord over others by it. So this is why we have elders. You see, in Acts 15, there were some people who were offended at the Gentiles. And so they wanted to bring the Gentiles under Judaism because they didn't prefer them not being under, under Judaism. So what happened? The elders had to get together and decide what is appropriate and what is not appropriate. And when they decided that, they said, you have no business being offended at this. This is okay. Okay, so the elders maintained leadership of the church and that it wasn't led from the bottom up because after all, I'm the weak brother, you're offending me, everybody's got to change for me. No, sorry, the devil likes to do that. Just like the communist Democrats, they like to abuse a good principle to ruin it. They cry truth and fairness while they cheat, lie, and exhort. They cry con being constitutional while they shred the constitution. They accuse of targeting a political opponent while they target their political opponent. They accuse of abuse of power while they abuse their power. They accuse of a cover-up while they're covering things up. A cesspool of corruption. Disgraceful. And so we find that false brethren do the same in the church. You are a Christian, so you must love me, forgive me, help me, be patient with me, suffer me, and reach out to me. Well, I take advantage of you. Mm -hmm. We've seen that too many times. Yep. There's not enough love here. I'm not getting enough. I'm not being helped enough. Like, what are you doing? Are you a Christian too? Oh, if you say they're not a Christian, then that... Oh, I know. I'm really offended. <laughs> okay? But the one who's a Christian, you... You don't, the Christian doesn't demand love. They give love. Right, right. The Christian doesn't demand help. They give help. Right. Okay? Everything I don't like offends me. So you should not offend me while the world stands. This is why we have elders. To make decisions like in Acts 15. Because every principle can be pushed and abused. Uh, pushed to an extreme and thus abused and ruined thereby. Now chapter 9 begins. 
by Paul's illustrating this, this, okay? Paul is going to demonstrate the attitude that he has and operates on, which is a true Christian attitude, okay? And it starts out, Am I not an apostle? Am I not free? Have I not seen Jesus Christ our Lord? Are ye not my, uh, are ye, are not ye my work in the Lord? If I be not an apostle unto others, yet doubtless I am to you for the seal of mine apostleship, are ye in the Lord? Mine answer to them that examine me is this. Have we not power? The word power is the same word as liberty in the previous uh, chapter. It means privilege, right, authority. Okay? And so, <clears throat> he starts out and he says, yes, we all have knowledge, but you're missing a big portion of knowledge. And we all have liberty, but how you use your liberty determines whether you have the Spirit of Christ or not. We all have rights, but what does a Christian do with his rights? We all have privilege, but what does a Christian do with his privilege, his authority, his position, his rights? And so Paul's going to show them. Uh, and so in verses 7 to 14, he goes on through basically the fact that they that preach the gospel should live of the gospel, okay? And we can read that quickly here. Uh, have we not power to lead about a sister, verse 5, a wife, as well as other apostles, as a brethren of the Lord and Cephas? See, others are doing it. Don't we have power? Or I only and Barnabas, have we not power or liberty to forbear working? Who go out to work for any time at his own charges? Who planteth the vineyard and eateth not of the fruit thereof? Or who feedeth the flock and eateth not of the milk of the flock? Say these things to the man, or sayest not the law the same also? For it is written in the law of Moses, Thou shalt not muzzle the mouth of the ox that treadeth out the corn. Does God take care for oxen, or saith he it altogether for our sakes? For our sakes, no doubt, this is written, that he that ploweth should plow in hope, and he that thresheth in hope to be partaker of his hope. If we have sown unto you spiritual things, is it a great thing? If we shall reap your carnal things, if others be partakers of this power or liberty or privilege or authority over you, are not we rather? Okay, now, what does he say? Nevertheless, we have you not used this power, but suffer all things, lest we should hinder the gospel of Christ. You see where he's going. He hasn't changed subjects. He hasn't changed arguments. He is demonstrating the mind of a true believer as opposed to a false believer. Right. He's demonstrating the mind of one who says, what can I do for my Lord? As opposed to the one that's, what's God going to do for me? Right. Okay? He's demonstrating the two, and he's showing that he has lots of rights that he doesn't even uh, take advantage of because he doesn't want to hinder the gospel. Do you not know that they which minister about holy things live of the things of the temple, and they which wait at the altar are partakers with the altar? Even so, hath the Lord ordained that they which preach the gospel should live of the gospel, but I have used none of these things. That's the point. That's the whole point. Uh, a true Christian is not looking for loopholes in the law of God. The true Christian is looking for nuggets of gold, how they can be more like God. They're looking to engraft the Word in their heart. They're looking for ways of better understanding God's mind so that they can better live God's mind. <clears throat> there are a lot of things <coughs> that are indifferent matters. They can be argued that technically there's nothing wrong with this. Okay? So I want to do it. And yet that very thing could stumble somebody else. Okay? Now if I went to a country and I was in a, a place where a, a round rimmed felt hat with a coned pointed top... <coughs> If that meant absolutely nothing to that culture, and they had no association with it, it would be an indifferent thing. It's just a it's just a hat. It's just felt. It sheds water real nice. I mean, it it keeps the water off really good because of its design. And you can wear it there, and nobody would be stumbled. Nobody would think anything about it. But if you were in a place where that associated you with a witch, okay. It would become, in the principle, meat offered unto idols. 
And even though you could argue it's just a, it's just material, it's just a hat, it sheds water real, you can, you can argue and argue and argue. But you could stumble somebody because they associate you with witchcraft. You understand the principle. So even things that are all moral, indifferent, uh, perfectly fine, you need to think about the association. You need to think about who you're linking up with. You need to think about what message you are projecting by what you're doing. Indifferent matters such as eating meat. What's wrong with eating meat? Eat, com meat committeth us not to God for whether we eat, we're, we're not worse or we're eating not, we're the better. It doesn't matter. It's just meat. Paul says that's true. But if you're eating meat that people know is offered to idols and they bring it up and they tell you this is meat offered to idols and you say, no big deal. What have you just done? Mm -hmm. Or if you go sit in the idol temple and say, my mind is on the true God. I just, this is a good place to get a steak, and you know, it's just me. I don't, I don't care what they do with it. The, the idol's nothing. Okay, you can argue and argue and argue all you want about it, but what are you doing? Paul says, you're having communion with the devil. You go to church, okay? We partake of juice. What is the juice and the bread? I mean, it's just juice, just bread. No, it's communion. Right, right. Okay? There's meaning here. It's not just juice and bread, there's meaning. And so when you go and you eat meat offered to idols, there's something going on there besides the steak. Right. There's something going on there besides your digestion. Okay? And Paul says, you sin against Christ. You could cause a brother to go to hell because of your example. So, when it comes to other things in life, that felt hat with the point and the wide brim, sometimes it might be okay. But in some places, it's sin against Christ and can cause a brother to go to damnation. Big difference. So, a matter of shirt, pants, hat, oh, just material. You understand that witchcraft is always sinful. That hat may not always be bad, okay? So, we're talking about the difference between moral issues and indifferent issues. Now, as far as your clothes, as far as your music, as far as your hair, as far as uh, all the things that you do. You need to be tuned in to not just, what's wrong with it? What's wrong with it? What's wrong with it? Why can't I? Why can't I? Why can't I? You, you know, and looking for excuses, looking for loopholes, reasons why it's got to be okay. You need to get over that. Mm -hmm. A true Christian says now, what am I projecting concerning eternal values? What am I projecting for the younger generation who's watching me? What example am I setting? Is this going to be good? Would it be good if everybody did what I'm doing? Would it be good if everybody acted like me? Would it be good if everybody pursued what I'm pursuing and with the direction I'm going? Would it be good? Would it please the Lord? Would it grieve the Spirit? Those are the ideas that come from a man with the mind of the Apostle Paul, Amen. the true believer. Any indifferent, innocent thing that leads in a direction that hinders the gospel, hinders the work of the Lord, is damaging to the testimony of the church, becomes an idol, a meat offered to idols. It becomes something where you don't have liberty. And uh, we're not going to go any further today. We're going to stop right there. But I, wanted, I want you to see where Paul was going with his argument. We're going to continue on next week with his illustration of true Christian spirit. And then he's going to come to the conclusion, and you'll see that in no way, in no way is the Apostle Paul saying that, well, the decision in Acts 15 wasn't binding on everybody. No, that's not what he's saying. He's just taking these hot shots who think they know it all, and he's taking and agreeing with points in order to lead them to other points that they are ignorant of and not considering to show them. Yeah, you, you can say this and this and this, and that may be true, but you're forgetting about this and this and this. And that is a wise way to deal with arguments. Is to first acknowledge there are some there are some legitimate points here, but in light of the rest of the facts, okay, and wow, 
uh, <clears throat> what's going on in Congress. If, if, if there's some people who just want to listen to the shift sham. But if you want to listen to the rest of the story, you get the real picture of what's going on. And uh, quite amazing. Quite amazing. And we find the same thing. I mean, okay, I say the same thing in the spiritual realm. That is a spiritual war. Mm -hmm. There are spiritual things uh, at stake in the battle in Washington right now. There's future of principles, future of standards that are trying to be torn down, destroyed, wiped out, that we need to be concerned about, we need to be prayerful about. The same concern needs to be in the church, about standards in the church, about principles in the church. And I guarantee you, the carnal Corinthian mind is going to be fighting for all the little tidbits that are for its side and ignoring the rest of the story. Because only people who really care about truth look at the rest of the story. The only the, the people who really care about God's kingdom. You see, those of us who love the Lord, we believe that Jesus Christ it will soon come and set up His kingdom on earth. He is going to sit on the throne in Jerusalem. He's going to rule this planet with a rod of iron. That's going to take place. And you and I are in a placement test. Okay? That's the true believer's faith. See, before they have the NASCAR races and these Grand Prix or whatever they do, they have qualifying uh, tests. They qualify for where they're going to be in the lineup when the race starts. Are they going to be in the front, back? They qualify by racing and timing. Who has the best time, they get to be in the front. Okay? We are qualifying for the kingdom. You understand that? Five cities, ten cities. We are qualifying right now for placement in a much bigger race. Mm -hmm. A grander race. Jesus is coming back. He's going to reign. I am going to have a place. Now, this life is qualifying. The true believer has his eye on qualifying. The true believer has his eye on placement. The true believer is not looking for gratification in this life. The true believer is thinking about that race. They're thinking about placement. They're thinking about serving God in a, a, a way that they've never been able to serve Him before. A much greater opportunity. That's the true believer. Let's stand together. <clears throat> Any thoughts from the brethren? I was just thinking, it's interesting how when you just hear a part of the story, you can easily be convinced by it. But then when you hear the rest of the story, it's like, oh, that puts everything else in a totally different light. Uh, the logical conclusion is very different now. Mm -hmm. uh, so we should always desire, when there's a decision to make, to hear the whole story. And be slow, be slow when you hear something to immediately pronounce, you know, guilt or innocence. Because there's probably things that you didn't hear about it yet, maybe deliberately left out. Mm -hmm. um, but when somebody doesn't want to hear the rest of the story, that ought to be a bad indicator to us. I mean, that ought to be a warning signal to us. Mm -hmm. It's like, you're really not interested in knowing knowing what the correct thing to do would be in this situation. Right. A just judge doesn't just listen to the prosecution. He listens to the prosecution and the defense. A just judge is looking for the truth in the situation. He's not looking for furthering of an agenda of his own. Or, you know, a stubborn resistance to a statement he made, or whatever. Uh, a stubborn embracing of a statement that he previously made. He's looking for truth. Our Father is the just one. Jesus is the just one. 
And we need to be all concerned about that in our home, in our marriage, in our own life, honesty. Uh, we need to be looking at it for the per perspective of truth in the Bible. I, I believe that these people did not want to wear a head covering, and so therefore they misinterpreted 1 Corinthians 8 on purpose because of another desire. Okay, They, they needed something to undergird their argument. So twisting scripture is convenient. Any other thoughts before we pray? Alright, let's pray.